1951. He, uh, he says he's attended no preacher training school, owned the school of hard knocks, still working on a degree, <laughs> baptized 1984, and a member here since 1997. As I said, he's currently serving as an elder. We appreciate his family. And as we do all the elders, we appreciate their love for the truth and desire to be what the Bible says elders ought to be. And uh, that's saying a lot nowadays. And we love him for his work's sake as we do the other elders. And we ask you now to give ear to him as he speaks on this important subject. Brother Jack. I'd like to take the next five minutes and talk about how much I appreciate David Brown, but he'd use that against my time. <clears throat> but I do appreciate him so much, not only for the faithful stand that he takes, but also as the uh, fine example he is as an individual Christian. And I uh, certainly appreciate him very much, as I do my two fellow elders, uh, Buddy Roth and Ken Cohn. In fact, as I found out something about Ken the other day, he was willing to kind of take a bullet for all of us as we were having a dinner at his house Saturday evening, and I walk into the room, and he's in there by himself with Terry. <laughs> and Terry, Terry's just talking away, and Ken's just sitting there smiling. And I sit down, and of course, I couldn't say anything. Couldn't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> but I didn't notice Ken was grinning, and I finally figured out what he was grinning about. He had his deaf ear turned toward <laughs> Terry. <laughs> you still don't know what he said, do you? Uh, anyway, that was for you, Lester. <clears throat> One of the founding fathers of the United States and the second president of the U.S., John Adams, once wrote, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. I think you can understand by that statement why so many seek to change the Constitution or reinterpret it, because it hinders them. But we've been fortunate to live in a nation where we have certain freedoms, and a nation that practices the rule of law, at least for the moment, last November's election notwithstanding. But there are several essential characteristics to the rule of law such as the supremacy of law, which means that all persons, and that includes individuals and governments, are subject to the law. And there are many others, but another important aspect and characteristic of the rule of law is that the un an underlying moral basis for all law. With that thought in mind, we observe today that in education, media, politics, the religious denominational world, and sadly, some within the church itself. We see an attack on Bible-based morality as well as traditional morality. Because of these attacks, our nation is changing. It is different today than what it was just 20 years ago and has changed considerably over the 57 years of my life. People know less. People care less. They don't know as much as they used to know about God's law today than they did just 10, 20, or even 50 years ago. And I'm going to give you a simple, simple illustration of that. My brother Skip and I were talking just at Ken's house the other day about the changes in this nation since the 1950s when we both grew up as kids. But two years ago, while traveling and stuck in a hotel room, which when, when you're traveling, that happens a lot, I was watching a music history documentary on PBS TV, and the topic was country music and Patsy Cline. The documentary showed several clips of Patsy Cline's earliest television appearances. But one such appearance was Patsy singing the very first song that she released on record 53 years ago. And there was a line in that song that caught my interest. In fact, it's so much so when I returned home from the trip, I actually went and looked up the lyric to make sure I heard it correctly. The song is titled, A Church, A Courtroom, and Then Goodbye, written by Eddie Miller and W.S. Stevenson, and was released by Patsy Cline in, in 1955. And the lyrics go like this. The first scene was the church, then the altar, where we claimed each other. With tears of joy, we cried. Our friends wished us luck there forever as we walked from the church side by side. 
The next scene was a crowded courtroom, and like strangers, we sat side by side. Then I heard the judge make his, make his decision, and no longer were we man and wife. I hate the sight of that courtroom where man-made laws push God's laws aside. Then the clerk wrote our story in the record, a church, a courtroom, and then goodbye. There's another verse, but did you catch the lyrics in the third verse there? I hate the sight of that courtroom where man-made laws push God's laws aside. Only 50 years ago, people knew and understood what they were doing to God's marriage laws, whether they obeyed them or not. They knew it enough to set it to verse in popular music. But today, most people don't know. And even if they do, they do not care. And in fact, they're more likely to flaunt and parade their lawlessness. And today, man continues to set aside God's laws without understanding that civil government has no authority to change God's law. Civil government only has the authority to enforce that which God has put into effect. The attacks continue today on our Lord's church and his laws. His will for man is given to us in the Bible in general, in the New Testament in particular. Divorce for any cause is rampant in our nation and destroying homes everywhere. Remarriage without regard to one's eligibility according to God's commandments is a plague that causes people to lose their souls and congregation of the Lord's church to lose their way because faithless elders and individuals will not contend for that which is right, as the Bible defines right. New attacks on God's marriage laws are cutting at the roots of this great institution in the form of same-sex marriage, and I put that in quotes. Not a pleasant subject, but one as relevant to us today as divorce for any cause was in Patsy's song over 50 years ago. By what right does man seek to institute such civil laws? And this brings us to our topic this morning, marriage. Who is it that originated it and governs it? This is a timely and relevant topic on, in this twisted nation of ours where men are called evil good and good evil. Not in America only, but across most nations of this world is this kind of thinking prevalent. Today, as New Testament Christians, we need to know the answer to these questions. Who originated marriage? Who has the right, the authority, to govern the institution of marriage? Is it God? Or is it man and his civil law? Does one take precedence over the other? Brethren, today, not only do we need to seek and ask, ask these questions and seek the answers, but we need to do that within the sacred page. And we need to hear and obey the Lord's teachings on these matters. Who originated the institution of marriage? Well, that's a good place to start. Marriage in the home is the oldest of divine institutions. At the foundation of the home is the sacred covenant of marriage. It was in the Garden of Eden that God established marriage as an institution. In Genesis 2, we read of God taking the dust of the ground which he formed man and then taking a rib from man's side, he formed woman. He then presented the woman to the man. And we read in, Genesis, in the Genesis account that I, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh, Genesis 2, 23, and 24. There are a couple of points we should consider when we look at this passage. First, notice that God established the institution of marriage before there was a civil government. Second, that it was indeed a marriage, a marriage between a man and a woman, is forever established in verse 24, where it speaks of a man and his wife. The Bible plainly affirms that it was God's intention that there would be one man and one woman in a marriage until death severs the marriage bond, Genesis 2.24 and Matthew 19.8. Though God tolerated such things in the Old Testament as, as polygamy beginning with Lamech in Genesis 4.19 and, and a loose attitude regarding divorce as seen in Deuteronomy 24.1 through 4, he no longer tolerates such under the law of Christ. The New Testament Christian cannot justify a given marriage relationship by appealing 
to what God overlooked or allowed under the law of Moses. The authorization for any relationship, marriage or otherwise, must be found within the confines of the last will and testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. If any man goes beyond the teaching of Christ, he loses both God and Christ, 2 John 9. So this brings us to the question of authority. Why should we look to the Bible for authority in our marriage relationships? Even if God originated the institution of marriage in the Old Testament, why should we look to his son, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament for answers? What role does civil government play? Why should God's marriage laws be placed above man's civil laws? Who has the authority to govern the institution of marriage? Contrary to what man practices today, marriage was divinely instituted and is subject to divine rule and regulation. New Testament Christians should know and understand that even though uh, Jesus uh, New Testament Christians should know and understand that even though those of the world do not know, we should know. But like denominations around us, many in the Lord's church have also moved away from this simple Bible truth. Like the world, and, and more and more, they, they look to the government, man's law, for justification of their sinful behavior. Many times when we're studying the subject of marriage, uh, we ap appeal to uh, Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. We go there to determine if there is authority for sinful behavior, such as divorce for any cause. Regarding same-sex marriage, we often quote the, what Jesus had to say in Matthew 19, 4. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? As Jesus went on in the following verses to teach God's will regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we find these same passages that his disciples had difficulty accepting Jesus' teaching. They said, if, it is the case, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save to whom it is given, Matthew 19, 10, and 11. Why do we appeal to such hard sayings as these disciples apparently thought they were, why do we appeal to such plain teachings, the way I'd rather phrase it, for our authority when we study God's Word? We should look at Jesus Christ and, uh, you know, why should we look to Jesus Christ and the New Testament as the authority on these matters? That might be a good question. Why should we? Since the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular contains all that we need as it pertains to life and death, we must understand these basic principles concerning Christ's authority. When our Lord walked this earth, he taught as one having authority. During his earthly ministry, Jesus astonished the people in the synagogues with his teaching. Mark 1, 21 and 22 tells us, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. We read again in Mark chapter 6, verse 2, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? But it was not only those in the synagogue. The people were always astonished, also astonished by the Sermon on the Mount. We read in Matthew 7, 28 and 29 that it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them one, as one having authority and not as the scribes. What impressed and astonished the people was that Christ taught as one having authority. This was unlike the scribes who simply interpreted the law for the people. Jesus spoke as one who had the right to make law. The question might be raised, did Jesus have the authority to speak this way? He may have taught with authority, but was it his place to do so? Should we, who read today uh, that which he taught, give heed and obey what he said? At a time when many do not heed the word of Jesus, not only those in the world, but sadly, even many who profess him to be Lord, the authority of Jesus needs to be recognized and followed by all, especially, especially by those who claim to be his disciples. As we examine the authority that Jesus has, we can begin with the inherent right of Jesus' authority. 
First, he, was, he has authority by virtue of being the creator. All things were made through him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, uh, was with God, and the, God was, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We also read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that God, who at sundry times and divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. All things were made by him and for him. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.16, For by him, many Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. All things. That doesn't leave out anything. As the Creator, Jesus has the authority to expect and demand whatever he desires of his creation. Second, Jesus has authority by virtue of being the heir. As prophesied in the Old Testament, Jesus would be given all things. The psalmist wrote, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen from thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, Psalms 2, 7, and 8. As we read, read earlier in Hebrews 1, 2, the, the Son, Jesus Christ, had been appointed heir of all things by God the Father. As the heir, Jesus has authority over that which has been given to him. Third, Jesus has authority by virtue of being the Redeemer. Jesus has redeemed us from our sins. The Apostle Peter said, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as the Lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. This redemption Jesus has done with his own blood, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. As our Redeemer, he certainly has authority over those who have been purchased by his blood. As Creator, as Heir, as Redeemer, Jesus has both the inherent right and the earned right to speak with authority. Dare we live in your day not recognize such authority. Consider with me also uh, others who gave uh, voice to the uh, recognition of Jesus' authority. First, we might note that he was worshipped by angels. They worshipped him when he came into the world. The Hebrew writer declares in Hebrews 1, 6, and again, when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of earth worship him. And notice, as he sat on the throne of God, the apostle John wrote in Revelation 5, 10, and 12, And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the beasts and the elders, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Angels deemed him worthy to receive power, meaning authority. Second, notice that Jesus was recognized by demons. They acknowledged that he had the authority to destroy them. Mark wrote in Mark chapter uh, 1, uh, verse 23 and 24, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And notice that they obeyed his rebuke in the verses that follow. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out, Mark 1, 25 and 26. Even demons recognized and could not resist his authority. And third, as we consider others who gave voice of recognition to Jesus' authority, Jesus was praised by the redeemed, those that he had redeemed. The apostle John said in his vision that those before the throne of the Lamb subscribed ascribed a salvation to God in the Lamb, writing in Revelation 7, 9, 10, that the great multitude of the redeemed cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Even John 
praised Jesus for having authority over the kings of the earth, saying that Jesus was the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Revelation 1.5. If we are among the redeemed, as John certainly was, should we not also recognize his authority, as John did? Angels, demons, the redeemed, all recognize Jesus' authority. Dare we do anything less? Finally, as we finish our examination of the authority that Jesus has, let us consider the extent of Jesus' authority. First, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. For example, it was announced by Jesus himself prior to his ascension in, uh, in Matthew 28:18. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. His authority of power in his earthly life had been great, but now it's boundless and includes heaven and earth. Paul, speaking of the God of, uh, of the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, said in Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, which he, speaking of God, wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also... Uh, that in which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Peter said when speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 3.22, uh, speaking of Jesus, saying, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. His authority includes ruling over the kings of the earth as king of kings and lords of lords. Secondly, the extent of Jesus' authority extends beyond the kings and lords on earth. Having all authority in heaven and earth, Jesus is head over the church. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.18 that he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. He is the head of the church, even as he is the savior of the body, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.23. As the head of the church, he delegated authority to his apostles. Jesus promised the Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth, saying in John 16, 12, and 13, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear. That shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus told his apostles to teach others to observe all that he commanded in Matthew 28, 19, 20. Jesus proclaimed that whoso, whoever receives the apostle receives him. He said in John 13, 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receive, receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receive him that sent me. And again in Matthew 10, verse 40, he said, he that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Those who received the apostles received him, and those who received him received God. Men may choose not to receive him and choose to disobey the commandments of our Lord, but man sins when he does so, 1 John 3, 4. However, man cannot usurp or supersede the authority of Christ. For example, we do all if we do all that is required by our Lord to become a Christian, we hear the gospel, we believe it, we repent of our sins, we make the good confession, and are baptized for the remission of our sins, the Lord adds us to his church. Acts two forty seven. Question Who adds you to the church? Does Jesus have the authority to add you to his church? Well, of course he does. We just read. He is the head of the body, the church, Colossians 1.18. All power, all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28.18. Uh, and as long as you are faithful unto death, you will be given a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. If this land becomes a godless nation of atheists, and the ruling majority tells us that there is no God, Therefore, Jesus is not the Son of God, hence the church is incompatible with common beliefs. And you are sued in court to stop your intolerant, factious religious teachings in order to cease and give up such practices. But you remain faithful. 
Are you still a member of the Lord's Church? If the government should pass a law that makes the church illegal, and you are told that you are henceforth divorced from the bride of Christ, but you remain faithful, are you still a member of the Lord's Church? If the church is outlawed by the local, state, or federal government, and someone does all that is required in obeying the gospel, meeting all the requirements that Jesus demands to be met, Will Jesus add them to the church? The answer in every case is an absolutely and resounding yes. In every case, when a person obeys the gospel according to the commandments given us in the New Testament, Jesus will add them to, the, to his church. And as long as we are faithful in keeping his commandments unto death, Jesus is faithful in his promise to see that we remain in the body of the saved so that we will receive our crown of life because Jesus has the authority to do so. And as you continue to live in Christ, as a member of the Lord's church in good standing, as long as you remain faithful, no man or civil government can remove you from the Lord's church, because man cannot usurp the authority of Christ. And some of our brethren need to learn this lesson and apply it to other spiritual matters. Marriage was instituted by God, and it is his, his institution to define and limit, not man. Even though state, federal, and national governments allow divorce for any cause, remarriage regardless of eligibility, and may eventually deem same-sex marriage as civil law. God joins a man and woman in marriage, Matthew 19, 6. And civil courts and their rebellion to God's law may give you a piece of paper that the marriage is dissolved, Attempting to put asunder in Matthew 19, 6, God joined marriage with an unscriptural civil divorce, but only for fornication will God put it asunder. Matthew 19, 7, 9, or the death of a spouse, Romans 7, 2. God determines what constitutes a proper marriage, not man. Man, whether it's civil government, denominational institutions, brotherhood schools of preaching, are well-known gospel preachers who once stood for the truth, no matter the topic, same-sex marriage, marriage divorce remarriage, the reevaluation of affirmation of elders, fellowship matters, or any topic that pertains to godly living, man cannot usurp the authority of Christ. Man may exercise his free will and choose to disobey the Lord in these matters, but he sins when he does so, is lost and condemned to a devil's hell unless he repents. There we deny that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. What does the Bible teach about marriage and civil law? Well, first, it would serve every New, Christian, Testament, New Testament Christian well to do a survey of the biblical passages concerning these topics. And note Jesus' teaching on marriage. When the Pharisees came tempting him and asking him in Matthew 19.3, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Jesus called their attention to the original design of marriage. Jesus went back to the original design of marriage from the beginning as recorded in the book of beginnings, Genesis, appealing to the authority of Moses, an authority acknowledged by both the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he said unto them, Have ye not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, Matthew 19, 30. And Jesus points to the fact that marriage was instituted by God in the beginning and that marriage was designed for those created male and female. We might note here that the example given by Christ, Adam and Eve, were a natural male and a natural female, not some sort of surgically altered male or female, nor a transgendered person exhibiting appearance and behavioral characteristics of the opposite sex. So marriage is for a man and wife, one male and one female, who become one flesh, Matthew 19, 5. Regarding the nature of the marriage contract, it is a union of persons. The two shall be one flesh, so that as stated in Matthew 19, 6, they are no more twain, but one flesh. A man's children are pieces of himself, but his wife is as himself. The conjugal union is closer than that between parents and children. It is a 
it is in a manner equivalent to that between one member of the body and another member of the natural body. Paul uses the unity of marriage bond as an example when he discusses how husbands are to love their wives in the manner that Christ loved the church in Ephesians 5, 28 and through 33. In giving the reason why husbands should love their wives, uh, loving his wife as his own body and loving his wife even as himself, it is the reason why husbands should not put away their wives, for no man yet ever hated his own flesh or cut it off, but nourishes it and cherishes it and does all that he can to preserve it. Paul wrote, he that loveth his wife loveth himself, Ephesians 5.28. The unity of the marriage bond and the marriage relationship brings man and woman together, making the two one flesh. The two shall be one. Therefore, there must, not, there must be but one wife for one husband. For God made but one female Eve for one male Adam. Jesus shows in Matthew 19, 6, that marriage is a union that God joins, not the state, in spite of what the mayor of San Francisco and the justices of Massachusetts or any other city, state, or federal civil authority may say for that matter. After all, in Jesus' example, who joined Adam and Eve in marriage? It certainly wasn't any civil government. This is not to say that civil government does not have a role to play in marriage. But remember, civil government is subject to the authority of Christ, for he has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 20:18. Our civil government, man's law, is subject to and under the authority of Christ. Civil government and man-made laws are to serve only as an expedient to carry out the Lord's will on these matters. And that's the limit of his authority in matters of marriage, whether it concerns bringing a man and woman together in holy matrimony or in the matter of divorce. Man may try to put asunder in Matthew 19.6 God-joined marriage with a civil divorce, but only for fornication will God put his under. Death is the only other action that will dissolve a marriage. We learn from Jesus that one can obtain a civil divorce for a cause other than fornication and remarry, but he commits adultery in doing so. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Matthew 5, 31, 32. Vine's Dictionary defines adultery as unlawful intercourse between a married man and someone other than his wife, or between a married woman and someone other than her husband. All that to say this, a man may have a piece of paper saying he's divorced, but in fact still be married according to God. Otherwise, he would not commit adultery. We learn in Matthew 19, 9 that God allows divorce only for fornication and remarriage only by the innocent party. Jesus knew that this was a hard saying for some men as he went on to say that because of this, the kingdom of heaven may require some to make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, meaning remaining celibate, Matthew 19, 11, 12. Secondly, having looked at what Jesus had to say, let's examine the apostles' teaching on marriage. The Hebrews writer said that sex in marriage is honorable. Sex outside of marriage is not. Hebrews 13 and 4. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that to avoid fornication, let each man have his own wife. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. All other discussions by the writers of the New Testament, in fact, all passages in the word of our Lord pertaining to marriage, describe husband-wife, male-female relationships. These things were written by the apostles in spite of what the civil government of their day allowed. Can we do anything less today? No matter what man's laws may decree, we should always look to the one authority on these matters, God's Word. At a time when many do not heed the words of Jesus, not only those in the world, but sadly even those who profess Him as Lord, the authority of Jesus needs to be recognized and followed by all, especially by those who claim to be his disciples. Marriage was instituted by God, and it is his institution to find limits, not man's, even though federal, state, and national governments may allow divorce for any cause, or marriage regardless of eligibility, or eventually deem same-sex marriage as legal civil law. 
the only authority that civil law has in regard to marriage is to see that God's will is done on the matter. And God always determines what constitutes a proper marriage and not man. The sanctity of marriage has long been under attack. Divorce and remarriage for any reason other than fornication has undermined the institution of marriage for generations. Same-sex marriage is only the latest attack. And unfortunately, it probably won't be the last. And while same-sex marriage threatens the moral fiber of our society, so does adultery and unscriptural divorce. All deviations from God's design for marriage and family should be opposed. God intended for children to be raised in a loving family with the emotional security and nurturing that's provided by a loving father and mother. Divorce destroys what God intended. Same-sex relationships, and not marriages, cannot provide what God intended. And since government is to be God's minister for good, according to Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, our prayer is that our government and all governments around the world would so be, not only in matters pertaining to marriage, but in all matters that pertain to godly, Bible-based morality. Laws written to conform to the will of the majority in a worldly, secular nation, whether they permit divorce for any cause or marriage between ineligible partners or even marriage between any other than one man and one woman, cannot be taken as expressions of God's will. When denominations or even the Lord's Church represent and support compromises with man's sinful desires and laws that are contrary to our Lord's teaching, they cannot be trusted for guidance in matters of marriage or anything else, I might add. Instead, we should always look to God's word for authority in all that we do and say and conform our lives and our will to its teaching. Civil government and any law that man may create is subject to the authority of Christ. Civil government and man-made laws are meant to serve only as an expedient to carry out the Lord's will in these matters, and that is the limit of their authority in matters of marriage or any other spiritual matter that concerns godly living. As New Testament Christians, we should always remember that we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29, regardless of what civil government may say is legal or illegal. Thank you. Hearty amen. Indeed so. I would to God. I mean, and seriously, I know how to, how to say it, that elders everywhere, as well as preachers, that have that kind of knowledge of the Bible and conviction based thereupon, and from personal experience, the courage I've seen in these men to stand up for what's right, no matter the consequences. There's a few little Greek words that's going to come to haunt some people someday. Marriage is dissolved as it is put together by God. When men comply with God's will relative to both situations. I may epiphonia. Daniel, tell us what that means. I may epiphonia. Matthew nineteen nine except it be for fornication, literally, if not upon fornication. That's the only reason that a man or a woman who is a husband and wife has authority from God to dissolve a marriage. And that God's going to dissolve it when the fornicator is put away by the innocent party. The only other way God's going to dissolve it and one of the other party dies. I think it's important to also say that we're not saying the moment fornication is committed, God dissolves marriage. We're simply saying that when the person who's the innocent party, when that person's spouse has committed fornication, that that person has authority from God to put away the guilty of fornication spouse. It is then that God dissolves that marriage. 
it does not remain, and I know one reason why it does not remain, is because the innocent party is authorized by God to contract another marriage. Well, if the thing still was a marriage, God would have a situation where he's authorizing a person to have two wives, and that doesn't work. You can't help but folks one at a time. <laughs> sort of reminds me of what the African chief, who is noted to have these many tribes, a number of wives, practicing polygamy, the missionary was trying to teach him you can't have but one wife. He said, well, your own country doesn't pay attention to that. He said, we don't have polygamy outstanding in America. He says, no, uh, we just believe having all at once. You believe having one at a time. So we need to know and abide by the will of heaven and know that no civil law can counteract God's law, period. We're duty-bound by God's law to submit to civil law, and we sin if we don't. We're in civil law is in harmony with God's law. For when civil law is contrary and against God's law, we ought to obey God rather than men. Period. Thank you, Brother Jack. A great rest. Now, since I use the remainder of your time, we have a little extra. And thank you for giving that back. We'll stand to